I'm sure we all know that there are different kinds of numbers. The integers, evenly spaced on the number line, the fractions, which seem to go everywhere, then the real numbers, which fill up all the gaps unaccountably still left between the fractions, and which are represented by infinitely long strings of digits continuing off to the right. Which is actually kind of nuts if you think about it. Well, what if I told you there's a totally different kind of number you can make? One that gets represented instead as a string of digits continuing infinitely far off to the left. These are what we call the p-adic numbers, and that p stands for a prime number. To construct them, you first need to pick your favorite prime number. I'm going to pick 3, and then use that prime as a base to write your integers in. That is, instead of the digits in your number being 0 through 9 and representing powers of 10, they will be 0 through 2 and represent powers of 3. For example, the number 17 is made up of 1 9, 2 3s, and 2 1s, so in base 3, 17 is written 1 2 2. The key step is to come up with a new way to say how far apart these numbers are instead of the usual distance. What we'll do is to say that if the first n digits of two numbers are the same, then the distance between them is 1 over 3 to the n, so that numbers are closer together if many of their first digits are the same, just like real numbers, only in the other direction. Now, remember how I said the real numbers fill in all the gaps left in the number line? Now that we have a new way of measuring distance, the gaps show up in different places, and we get something different when we try to fill them all in. What we get are the free attic numbers, since we chose to go with 3 as our prime. This process of filling in all the gaps is called completion, by the way, if you want to look it up. Now that we have the free attic numbers, we are free to do addition, multiplication, even find square roots. So, we know how to get these free attic numbers and how to write them, but what do they actually look like altogether, and where do they fit on the number line? The answer is, they don't. We'll need to do something completely different. There are different things you could do, but what I've come up with is something I'll call a p-adic well. Build it, we take a line segment, this is what will turn into our number line, and then raise two walls of height 1 so that we have three wells, and all the wells and walls have the same width. Three wells, since we chose 3 as our prime number. Then, in each of the wells, Raise a couple of walls so that you end up with three smaller wells. I guess you can see where I'm going with this. You keep on doing this until you have infinitely many, infinitely small wells. And what's left at the bottom of the wells? That's our number line. You might think there can't be anything left at the bottom since we put in all those infinitely many walls, but trust me, there is. But how do we get from a p-adic number to its position on this weird number line? You number the wells 0 to 2 and put the number into the well corresponding to its first digit. For the smaller wells, again number them 0 to 2 and put the number into the well corresponding to the next digit, keeping it up for all the digits of the number. In this case, we'll end up somewhere right around here. And the reason we made sure to put in all of those walls is that they let us measure the distance between the numbers on the number line. The way it works is that the distance between any two numbers is exactly the height of the tallest tower between them. One thing that can be helpful in finding out what something really looks like is to look at the open sets. And the handy kind of open set to use is a ball. To make a ball, you pick some point to be your center and pick some radius. The ball is then made up of all the points whose distance from the center is less than the radius. On the regular number line, these just look like open intervals with the sensor in the middle. In the p-adic well, balls look like this. Choose some point to be your sensor and mark your radius on the vertical axis. Then, imagine pouring water into the well from the sensor you chose and letting it rise up to the level of the radius, but don't let it overflow if the radius is right at the top of one of the walls. Then the ball is made up of all the points on the number line that are now underwater. Now that we have a way of drawing these things, we can say a few things about them. For example, when constructing this ball here, 
what would we have gotten if we had decided to use one of these points down here as the center instead? The exact same ball, right? So that's a pretty weird result right there. In the p-adding numbers, every point in a ball is its center. Another thing that should be easy to see is that it's quite possible for two different balls to contain exactly the same points, but have different radii. If the radius of this ball here, for example, had been a little lower, we wouldn't have changed what points it contained. Speaking of different balls, we might wonder what it looks like in the periodic numbers if two balls intersect. It shouldn't be too hard to see that in that case, one of the balls, the one with the smallest radius, must lie completely within the other one. Overlapping just a little bit is simply not allowed. This sort of geometry may seem very strange, but periodic numbers are a very powerful tool in number theory and have even been used to try to describe physical phenomena such as quantum gravity or cosmological inflation. So perhaps it's not so much the numbers that are wonderfully weird, but this world we live in.